Hello friends, welcome back. Good morning, good evening, namaste. In the second lecture, I explained about the dosha transformation uh, or the dosha remodeling happening in individual tissues and how does it uh, follow a certain Kedara Kulinyaya and Kalika Putanyaya. I also explained about how to understand the health of an organ and how these organs are derived from different individual tissues as per Ayurveda and uh, how to apply the Kedara Kulya and Kalika Pratanyayas in understanding the organ uh, health. If you have missed that lecture, please watch it now because you know we're going to talk a little more advanced concepts uh, in this lecture. Let me go a little deeper and try and explain uh, my perspective about how diseases need to be interpreted. For example, it's a common practice for us as cardiologists, cardiac surgeons. We often see that you know in a certain individual, hypertension could lead to, you know, majority of individuals, it leads to uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. But in certain individuals, we have uh, repeatedly been seeing that it could lead to thinning of the left ventricle. How do you explain this? We don't know. And also, you know, in certain individuals, uh, the ischemic heart disease has very ra narrow vessels, you know, even if it is not associated with diabetes. And uh, in some individuals, the, the plaques are uh, soft and sometimes uh, very rarely are calcified. And what guides these processes is something that I want to you know, throw light on. In Ayurveda, uh, heart disease is beautifully explained as a Vatatmaja Hridroga or a Pithatmaja Hridroga or a Kafatmaja Hridroga or a Sanipataja Hridroga or a Sahaja and a Krimija. What it means is ischemic heart disease or for that matter any heart disease should be classified into uh, a Vata mediated ischemic heart disease or a Pitta mediated heart disease or a Kapha mediated ischemic heart disease. What happens in these three different pathways is that Vata because of its propensity to accumulate more salts it leads to calcification uh, score being high. Uh, and a pitta mediated uh, ischemic heart disease is uh, predominantly comprised of blood clots and a kapha mediated uh, you know uh, ischemic heart disease would lead to predominant uh, formation of soft plaques so this is a beautiful correlation so the amount of soft plaque or blood clots or the calcification index actually gives an idea of what dosha led to that particular this is and why is it so important is because you have to deploy uh, personalized regimen, dietary exercise, um, supplement regimen in different you know pathways. So that's how you need to understand that every disease has a vata component or a pitta or a kapha component. Similarly, cancers. Now, cancers you know in Ayurveda are classified into vata atmaja, vata gulmas, pitta gulmas or kapha gulmas. Gulma is a word used by Charaka Maharshi to denote a uh, benign tumor and Arbuda is the word used by Sushruta Maharshi who happens to be the uh, first surgeons across the world you know uh, in documented history he was there at least 40,000 years ago and uh, uh, he uses the word Arbuda to denote uh, a malignant cancer and then he also described that based on the location they could be you know tissue based location they, they could be Rasad, Rasa Arbudas, Rakta Arbudas, Mamsa Arbudas, uh, Medha Arbudas, Asti, Majja, Shukra Arbudas and things like that and uh, based on the dosha predominance these Arbudas again are classified into Vata Arbudas, Pitta Arbudas and Kapha, Kapha Arbudas and there, there are several classifications you know based on the dosha predominance as defined in this text. What they are saying is cancers could be Vata mediated or Pitta or Kapha mediated. Why is it so important? Well, let me explain. You know, you all remember the Lee Chatelet's principle from you know our twelfth class organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry. So, what this reaction, what this principle deals with is when when A and B reversibly react to form C and D, the reaction either moves forward or backward under the influence of an external uh, factor to balance the external factor. So, what it means is take the example of cancers. So cancers are primarily mediated by the expression of oncogenes, isn't it? This is what we, we, we know. Of course, there are certain cancers like ER or PR positive cancers that lead to you know, certain breast cancers and uh, ovarian cancers and things like that. But then even the receptors have to be uh, expressed by a certain expression of a certain genetic locus, isn't it? So primarily, 
most of the cancers, if not all of the cancers are gene mediated. So a certain expression of a certain gene, locus, oncogene ideally, leads to the formation of cancer in a certain uh, organ. Now, another thing that we all sh as doctors, scientists should understand is that these oncogenes, you know, we have approximately 99.9999999% of the genome across all individuals, across the whole world, you know, across the uh, entire 7.87 billion people is pretty much the same, isn't it? Now, which means you are, each of the individuals have all the oncogenes essentially. Why aren't they getting expressed in all the individuals is, is the question that we need to ask. So, my explanation is that you know, it's the internal environment that actually is triggering the expression of the oncogenes, right? So, which means in the Le Chatelet's reaction, if the internal environment A plus the oncogenes react to form cancer C plus D, uh, the toxins, what we are doing is by chemotherapy or radiation therapy or surgical therapy, we are definitely, you know, helping the patient to decrease the component C in this particular, you know, uh, cancer or tumorigenesis. But then, again remember that when external factor uh, increases or, or decreases the uh, initial reactants and products, the reaction moves in a direction so as to compensate the external force. So, in this reaction, of uh, tumor regenesis that I just explained, the component C is reduced by radiation or chemo or surgical excision. So what will happen is ideally the A and B, the internal environment and the, the leads to further expression of the genes and that these two combine to form, uh, to increase the production of C which is the cancer itself. So that's, that pretty much explains the relapse of several cancers. And sometimes the, uh, the, the, the more the impact of the internal environment, the more uh, fulminant could be the cancer or more aggravated uh, spread could be the cancer. So, so here we are not talking about how to change the internal environment, isn't it? So uh, the component A is not altered and hence the relapse could be possible. This is just hypothetical, hypothetical friends, uh, but this definitely has to be taken into consideration and I feel that the ancient science has definitely shed light on how to actually alter the internal environment so that the oncogenes get uh, repressed and uh, the those genes that are responsible for health get expressed friends so this is about cancer so in 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 uh, if you look at the you know latest data that is available from di uh, on diabetes friends you know see uh, endocrinologists are saying you should keep your H hb a1c below 5.5 the American Diabetic Association says it should be below 6.5. The American College of Physicians sets it between 7 and 8. American Gerontology sets it at 7.5. The ECHOR trial sets it at 8.5. And the VADT trial sets it at 9.5. So now, now friends, the problem is where do you set your personal, your patient's uh, uh, glycated hemoglobin level at? Isn't it a big question? Uh, and also, you know, if you look at the latest guidelines given by the American College of Physicians, I think the, it's a guideline number three. It clearly says that, you know, in 2019, they, the guidelines uh, uh, definitely recommend to personalize the blood glucose levels for your patient to suit to their metabolic requirements. But how do you know the metabolic index of an individual? We don't know, isn't it? Do we have a measure? I don't think we have a credible measure of uh, an understanding the metabolic index of an individual of or of an individual organ. And uh, if you look at the cholesterol, say for example, HDL is called as a good cholesterol, LDL is called as a bad cholesterol. But uh, uh, certain you know changes in the CETP locus of the gene has led to increase in HDL, and increased HDL in Caucasians has caused heart attacks that is directly related to the plaque that is formed in these individuals has uh, high proportions of HDL that was proved by the Danish Research Institute, Abel Home et al. led this research institute. I mean, when they were targeted to uh, keep this uh, LDLs and triglycerides less than 100, Melinsky et al. had demonstrated that this actually was the cause of, uh, you know, heart attacks in 75 percent of the patients uh, that they have investigated in a certain research and you know, I think it is about more than uh, 12,000 or one uh, 12,000 patients were investigated. It's a huge study. So when does a good cholesterol become bad and when does a bad cholesterol become good is something that we don't know today. 
there is definitely of course you know there is some data suggesting that increased hdl has helped some, some individuals and decreased ldl have uh, has uh, uh, helped some other individuals how do you understand this disease or the metabolic disease that we are talking about you know be it hypercholesterolemia or be it you know hyperglycemia is uh, something that uh, has to be understood you know i would want to you know throw some light on this as well friends look at this so now we talked about electrophysiology isn't it uh, what vata does is it makes the tissues hyper excitable when the tissues become hyper excitable we all know that towards the end of an action potential the uh, the cell uses up atp to generate i mean to reverse the ionic homeostasis or to achieve the ionic homeostasis isn't it sodium and chloride are pushed out, outside and uh, outside of the cell and from the extracellular fluid potassium is taken back into the cell to come back to the original ionic homeostasis so atp is spent faster in a vata uh, environment now what does it mean it means the the glucose demand of vata tissues is high isn't it where does atp come from atp comes from only by uh, you know uh, the burning up of uh, combustion of uh, your glucose c6 h12o6 plus 6o2 gives rise to co2 6o2 molecules and 6h2o plus atp so atp is used up faster in vata and hence the the body needs to produce more atp so the vata systems if they are not supplemented by appropriate amounts of gl glucose then they suffer and that's exactly what ayurveda says you know when you give a dietary protocol to vata based uh, vata predominant individuals the diet is loaded with you know a high glycemic indexed foods so see how uh, this electrophysiology of vata is actually guiding or uh, uh, leading to a higher demand of glucose by you know demanding more atp for its uh, restore uh, restoration of the ionic homeostasis the pitta uh, in our uh, experimental models we demonstrated how pitta are co directly correlated to the mitochondrial system so excess of pitta leads to hyper mitochondrial activity hyper mitochondrial activity again requires the substrate of glucose isn't it is the glucose that burns up in the uh, you know mitochondrial systems and then you know, in the glycolysis first and then the the krebs cycle in the mitochondria and then you know followed by the ets electron transport system producing atp now what happens in excessive pitta is that you know the body demands more glucose in which uh, if the body demands or the t a certain cell which has aggravated pitta demands more glucose it is just simply logical that you need to feed those systems with higher amounts of glucose so which means in individuals who have either excessive vata or pitta or combined vata pitta aggravation you you would need a higher level of blood glucose so that is that pretty much explains why vadt you know pins down the hba1c to be less than or equal to 9.5 and that also explains how why certain cohort of individuals in accord trial were doing good when their hba1c was set at 8.4 and why the cv mortality uh, increased the cardiovascular mortality increased by 32% in this accord trial when the hba1c was tried to uh, you know pushed harder and then tried to maintain less than 6.5 so this pretty much you know the vpk essentially gives a beautiful understanding of why certain individuals require you know higher amounts of glucose why certain individuals you know require lesser amounts of glucose if you understand the glucose metabolism in the light of vata pitta kapha in the dimension of vata pitta kapha then you can actually personalize the blood glucose levels i mean the personalize the levels of blood glucose in your in your patients isn't it friends it's a beautiful sign now let's uh extend this logic further to understand the fat metabolism now what is happening in the fat metabolism so again extrapolate the electrophysiological studies vata sets in hyper excitability that sets in higher demand for atp isn't it if you don't supply glucose at that particular point of time when vata is aggravated or when is when is vata aggravated when you are intellectually you know uh, working at a higher you know intellectual level or you know when you are uh, when you are tense when you didn't sleep when you were working or when you were you know uh, under uh, uh, under intense duress the brain is active the brain is active usually normally in the br brain uses up about 33% of your blood glucose when the when you are under extreme stressful condition or when you are exposed to a higher intellectual activity the brain is using up more you know and hence the body requires more glucose isn't it if you don't 
give the brain or a certain organ that is actually you know, under a pitta or a vata aggravated state. What will happen uh, and when the blood glucose levels go low, the body automatically triggers something called as gluconeogenesis. It produces, it burns up your fat to produce glucose and once the fat is depleted, it burns up your proteins to produce glucose. Once the, once the uh, stores of fat, I mean first the stores of polysaccharides in the form of uh, glycogen storage gets de get depleted, then you know the, the fat get depleted, then the proteins, whatever the body can shed will be depleted and many people complain with you know loss of their weight, loss of mass, muscle mass. Once this happens, the body sets in something called as uh, breaking up of or burning up of your visceral fat. That is going to be dangerous for your internal organs and this is validated in the study called HUNT where excessive usage of statins has actually led to uh, interstitial tubular necrosis or a liver failure or a new form of heart failure or you know early onset of senile dementia and other um, conditions like Alzheimer etc. See now without understanding the vata pitta kapha of an individual or without understanding the VPK proportions in individual organs will you be or will we be able to personalize your diet or exercises or supplement regimen? No. So friends, I just wanted to quickly give you a summary of how the important are ex uh, understanding the vata, pitta, kapha and uh, in the light of you know the glucose and uh, fatty metabolism and also in the light of you know several controversies coming on uh, diabetes and you know um, blood uh, cholesterol levels, uh, I wanted to give you an idea that the dimensions of vata, pitta, kapha really give you a beautiful overview and a bird's view of the metabolic processes happening inside the body and then accordingly customize the need for maintaining a certain level of either blood glucose or HDL or LDL or VLDL or triglycerides etc and so on and so forth friends. Thank you very much, you know we will meet in the next lecture with the continuation of the orientation program.